I'm going to talk today about pelvic congestion diagnosis. We're going to talk about the definition of pelvic congestion syndrome, the diagnostic options, and how to choose the proper diagnostic tool. First of all, we're going to talk about the definition of pelvic congestion syndrome. Pelvic congestion syndrome is a really bad name for this syndrome. The problem is really that nobody has come up with a better name. The phrase pelvic congestion syndrome obviously means pelvic, that means relates to the pelvis, congestion, which means overcrowding or full, and syndrome, which is a variable collection of symptoms and signs all grouped together to be this one entity. However, in the literature, there have been many medical definitions proposed in the past, mainly about the non-cyclical pain in women for a certain amount of time, but they're not very useful. For instance, most people writing about pelvic congestion syndrome state it is a syndrome usually found in women, usually after childbirth. I find this very surprising. Most of these authors go on to explain how reflux in the ovarian vein usually is in the left ovarian vein and can cause varicose veins and pelvic venous hypertension, basically related to this left-sided vein. But it doesn't take much thought to realise they're discussing a left ovarian varicocele. As soon as you say that word varicocele, you should realise that men get the same. We all know that varicoceles occur in men. We know that one of the symptoms of this is aching on standing, just the same way that women get aching with a left ovarian varicocele. But just because men have testicular varicoceles on the outside, they get diagnosed and treated. The same doctors don't realise that women get the same condition with the same aching, so it's in both men and women. Thinking pelvic congestion syndrome is a female-only problem is clearly illogical. We've also published research showing that pelvic venous congestion appears to be common in women who have had children as women who haven't had children when we look at reflux. Admittedly, it may be worse after pregnancy, but the prevalence doesn't make any difference with the pregnancy. Therefore, when we define pelvic congestion syndrome, we have to remember it's both men and women pre- and post-pregnancy. Basically, it's just another form of varicose veins, but this time in the pelvis. So how can we go about defining pelvic congestion syndrome or diagnosing it? Over the last 20 years, we've found in our unit that most patients with, patients with pelvic congestion syndrome have primary pelvic venous reflux, just like varicose veins, in at least one of the four pelvic vein territories. That's right and left gonadal veins, right and left internal iliac veins. It's only a very small number of patients who have it secondary to obstruction. Now, the obstructions often have names such as Nutcracker syndrome, Maytherna syndrome, deep vein thrombosis, or NIVL, non-thrombotic non iliac vein lesion. This large number of different clinical presentations are due to the different patterns of veins that are involved. It really depends on how many of the four groups of veins are refluxing and which of their tributaries are dilating. It also depends whether the underlying problem is reflux alone or has combined obstruction as well. Therefore, when we think about our patients presenting clinically with this reflux, there are four different elements. I categorise them as two sets of symptoms, two sets of signs. These are, firstly, symptoms inside the pelvis. Secondly, symptoms outside the pelvis. Firstly, or thirdly, but the first of the signs, signs emerging from the pelvis. And finally, signs remote from the pelvis. So the first of these, symptoms inside the pelvis. These are your chronic pain in the pelvis, chronic pelvic pain, or CPP. This could be one side or the other across the whole of the lower abdomen. Often there's a dragging or aching pain, particularly on standing or sitting down. And this gets better when you lie, especially if you raise your bottom. There's also deep dyspareunia, a medical term meaning pain on sexual intercourse deeply. There's irritable bowel, irritable bladder. Those are all internal symptoms. The second are symptoms outside of the pelvis, and this is low back pain, groin pain, and we've recently published two, paper, uh, two patients in a paper showing that they've got hip pain just from pelvic congestion syndrome. The third then is the first of the two signs, and these are signs of veins emerging from the pelvis, either vaginal or varicose veins in the woman, testicular varicocele in the men, perineal and buttock varicose veins in both sexes, and of course piles or hemorrhoids. The fourth and final of these signs are those veins that are remote from the pelvis. These are most commonly varicose veins of the legs. Any signs are because they may be hidden, such as venous discoloration or leg ulcers. Then, of course, with obstruction, there's suprapubic varicosities across the bottom of the abdomen or up the flank. Or it may be swelling of one or both legs if there's obstruction. 
Of course, you must remember, any of these symptoms or signs can present with other conditions, so they're not pathognomonic of definitely having pelvic congestion syndrome. However, every doctor seeing patients with any of these signs must think of pelvic congestion syndrome. So, once you think of it, what diagnostic options should you use and in what situation? Once you think a patient might have pelvic congestion syndrome, you need to think of the diagnostic tests to confirm or refute it. For the majority of patients which have simple venous reflux and no obstruction, you can do quite a few tests, but most have major drawbacks. Gynecologists will often tell you about laparoscopy, but this is actually not a very good test for this condition. The re reason is, although you can exclude other pathologies such as tumours, adhesions or endometriosis, you can't actually see the veins apart from a ghosting the other side of the peritoneum. And even if you see great big veins, you can't actually see any hemodynamic information. So you can't see whether those veins are refluxing or not. You may decide that you want to do CT scan or MRI. The CT scan or MRI seems logical because these veins are deep inside the body, and doctors always think of CT or MRI if for something deep inside the body. The difficulty with these scans is that the patient is usually lying flat in the scanners, and varicose veins don't reflux when the patient is lying flat. Therefore, it doesn't actually show you the reflux. Also, if you are using CT or MRI, most doctors diagnose pelvic venous reflux on the diameter of the vein. But we've already published that the cutoffs that most people use, or 6 or 8 millimeters, is not abnormal. In the European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery, we showed that if you correlate reflux with the diameter, there is no correlation. Therefore, this should not be used and is not a very good way of diagnosing pelvic congestion syndrome at all. Now, most doctors, especially radiologists, think that venography is the recommended option. But this, of course, depends how it is performed. The trouble with venogram is the good thing, rather, about the venogram is that you can tip the patient and you, so you can put them into reverse Trendelenburg and see reflux. However, as we presented from the Whiteley Clinic in the UIP meeting in January 2018, we showed that ovarian vein reflux usually starts at the bottom of the vein and ascends. Therefore, it depends where your catheter tip is as to whether you see the reflux or not. In addition, contrast is denser than blood, and because it's not physiologically dense the same as blood, it won't flow the same way as venous blood. The fact you inject it under pressure makes the proper flow mimicking blood even less likely. Venous duplex ultrasound has always been the gold standard for visualizing veins and looking at hemodynamic function in the legs or in the neck or in the arms. Some authorities have suggested that transabdominal venous duplex ultrasonography is therefore going to be the best way to diagnose pelvic congestion syndrome. However, this is really only the case in relatively slim patients who can be, and then you can use and see the upper gonadal veins. The problem is you can't really see the lower ends of the veins, particularly if the patient is larger, and also bowel gas can get into the way. So if you want to see the distal gonadal veins, not under the tributaries of the internal line veins, you can't really see this with transabdominal duplex ultrasonography. And this is where the problem is in the patients who have got pelvic congestion syndrome. So therefore, if you don't do anything else, you're not getting to the point of the major problem in most patients. And this brings us on to what is the gold standard, and that is transvaginal venous duplex ultrasound. And in this, you have to use the hold stock protocol where the patient is lying in 45 degrees, you can see the whole of the bottom end of the gonadal veins, and you can also see the internal iliac veins, as developed by Judy Holdstock. You have to put the patient in 45 degrees because that means that you get gravitational reflux. We've published a study looking at the difference between transvaginal venous duplex ultrasound and venography using the gold standard of whether patients got better or not. And this study showed that transvaginal venous duplex ultrasonography, provided you use the Holdstock Harrison protocol, is the gold standard. It also showed something very interesting, and that is that patients who have only ovarian vein reflux is only 3% of the problem. Therefore, if you're using anything that doesn't look at the internal islet veins, you're missing 97% of patients' problems. Now, some patients can't have transvaginal venous duplex ultrasound. In some men, well, obviously all men without a vagina, and also in women who have either an aversion or an anatomical reason they cannot have transvaginal duplex, you can't use this. And so you have to use combination of other tests. And we have to accept that this is suboptimal, but we have to accept it.
Now we can turn to obstruction and the less common patterns of pelvic congestion syndrome. With it, uh, with, when you're looking at the less common patterns such as may thurner syndrome, we're looking for a narrowing or stenosis of the vein. When we're looking at these, more important, we're looking for a narrowing. Now, if we're looking for a narrowing, it doesn't tell us whether the blood flow is significantly changed or not. CT or MRI will give us a very nice pictures, but recent prize-winning research from our unit has shown that you can actually make what looks like a nutcracker thin syndrome or a may Thurner syndrome narrowing disappear if you tip the patient upside down into a Trendelenburg test. This is therefore called a pseudo nutcracker or pseudo may Thurner. In other words, it's not there if you actually dilate the vein up properly. Therefore, unless you can tip the patient into the Trendelenburg position, you can't see that, and you can't in the CT or MRI. Venography can show these narrowings well, and can also allow the patient to be tipped into a Trendelenburg position. It's an invasive technique, and also you can go on to cause all different uh, uh, things like stenting, and you can use different treatment options at the same time. And you can also use pressure measurements. So therefore, this is obviously very useful in obstructive uh, conditions. Duplex ultrasonography can be used to diagnose obstructive conditions um, depending on the patient's habitus. For example, you can use uh, transabdominal techniques and you can use uh, different techniques to remove bowel gas, uh, gas such as clean prep or giving windies and this will get rid of the gas in the abdomen. Finally, of course, you can also use IVUS, intravascular ultrasound. The thing with IVUS is it doesn't actually give you hemodynamic information. It does give you very, very accurate information as to the cross-sectional area of the vein. It's also very expensive to other techniques. So therefore, what is the optimal choice in imaging pelvic congestion syndrome? With our 20 years of experience, this is what we've found. First of, first of all, most patients, of course, are reflux only. So therefore, in female patients presenting with possible pelvic congestion syndrome or varicose veins of the legs arising from the pelvis, we say firstly transvaginal venous duplex ultrasound scan using hold stock Harrison protocol. Combine this with transabdominal duplex ultrasound scan to look for nutcracker, methane or nivel, particularly if you get rid of the bowel gas. If you have any suggestion of an obstructive lesion in the islet veins, we would use air plethysmography because it's non-invasive uh, in the first instance, and then we follow that with MRI. If that hasn't given us an answer, we can go on to IVUS. And in the last resort, we can then go to venography with pressure measurements if we need it. But that is exceptionally rare. You need that as a diagnostic tool. In male patients or women unwilling or unable to have transvaginal duplex ultrasound scan, presenting with either possible pelvic congestion syndrome or varicose veins coming from the pelvis, we go straight to transabdominal duplex ultrasound with bowel preparation to look for the venous reflux as well as the obstructive lesions. If there's a problem or we're not 100% certain, we then back that up with MRI. If there's a suggestion of an obstructive lesion in the islet veins, we look at the MRI again and obviously use air plethysmography for function. At that point, if we're not certain, we can go onto IVUS and once again, as a last resort, go onto venography with pressure measurements. So that will tell us both whether there is a problem or, uh, or not at that time and also may lead us to being able to perform a technique such as stenting or coil embolization at the same time. Thank you.